Okay, so part two, let's talk a little bit more about uh, paramedics and stress and how it affects us. One of the things to be aware of is that we are a profession that's in crisis about uh, stress. And I'll tell you a bit of a story. A few years ago, um, there were some first responders who committed suicide in Canada, and paramedics specifically, that had committed suicide. And it came to the attention of a group called the Tema Contour Memorial Trust. They're at uh, www.tema.ca. Great group. Really great group. I strongly endorse them. They're really helping to raise the awareness of stress disorder within um, all emergency services personnel, not just paramedics. Although the folks who founded it were paramedics and Tema Contour was a patient of a paramedic named Vincent Savoia. Vince Savoia. And uh, he was the founder of the Tema Contour Memorial Trust. He uh, founded it in memory of her because he was quite affected by that call. Anyway, um, a paramedic had committed suicide and they notified Tema and basically said this is what happened. And as Tema heard more and more about paramedics uh, committing suicide, just sort of haphazardly through informal channels, they uh, became a bit of a clearinghouse. They let people know, you know, if you hear about somebody committing suicide, let us know. If you hear about these sorts of things going on, we want to know about that. And they started to track how often this was going on for the first time, really. And they were surprised by the findings. So before I actually tell you what they discovered, I'd like you to think a little bit. In a country the size of Canada, there's about 35 million people, it's a little larger than Australia, how many paramedics do you think are committing suicide a year? One? Five? Ten? Whereabouts do you think it is? Well, what Tema found out as they started uh, to monitor paramedics committing suicide is that there was about one a week. That, and this is from 2014. These numbers have stayed consistent since then. That there's roughly, on average, one paramedic committing suicide every week due to post-traumatic stress, which is astounding. It's just an astounding number. In response to that, um, there became a lot of public awareness. This website is an example of that sort of reporting. People became more aware. People started saying we should do something with the strength of that awareness. A uh, bill was brought yet again before the Ontario provincial government, which is the equivalent of a state government here. And uh, in the past, paramedics had to prove that their job had caused the uh, post-traumatic stress. And that was incredibly difficult to do. I got quarantined during the SARS epidemic. I thought I was going to die. I wrote a will. I, you know, it was just really traumatic for me. And when I brought my case to the Workers' Compensation Board, they said, well, that's just a part of your job. We're not going to compensate you for that. And I was actually never compensated for the fact that I got post-traumatic stress clearly from a job diagnosed by three different healthcare professionals. So it was really difficult to, to uh, get help because it was the government basically saying, yeah, it's going to be really expensive. We don't want to do that. So a bill was brought before government based on you know all that was going on. And as a result, uh, there is now the presumption, this is a slightly older um, uh, news clipping, this bill passed remarkably. And now the presumption is that if a paramedic in Ontario gets post-traumatic stress, that it was due to their job. And workers' compensation has the onus then to prove that it wasn't due to their job, which is pretty tough to do. So this is a lot better. The secondary traumatization that was going on by the horrific policies that were in place is now hopefully going to stop and people will be getting better help. And uh, this is something for all paramedics to take a look at as an example of how if you have knowledge and if you have information and if you can get that in front of the public, you can often get a change. So what's causing all of this distress? Why are paramedics killing themselves? What is it about this job that is so uh, detrimental to the people who perform it? And it's not just people killing themselves. There's a lot of suffering that doesn't get as far as suicide, much more than the people who commit suicide. Not to diminish the suicide that's happening, but if you add up the absolute numbers of people who are suffering, there's more people who are alive and suffering probably than those who died. So how does this all happen? And this clip, by the way, uh, comes from the Tema website and an awareness 
campaign that they had of the, how, what a toll the stress takes on paramedics. And it was called their human or heroes are human campaign. Great campaign. Commercials are on YouTube too if you want to take a look for them. So. What is it that's causing all this trouble for us? Well, first of all, there's the normal, the expected stuff. If you say to somebody, I'm a paramedic, they immediately start imagining the sort of things that you're taking a look at. And this is a particular study, uh, 2014, that talks about uh, what paramedics list as things that are stressful for them. And if you take a look at it, it's all basically gruesome, threatening stuff, the stuff that we expect that paramedics are going to see in the course of their job. However, there's a lot of stuff as we've done further research on this, and by we, I mean people other than me, um, there's a lot of things that were unexpected when researchers started to ask paramedics, what is it that's so stressful about your job? And one of the big things, in fact, one of the biggest things that paramedics found stressful was a sense of helplessness, a sense of not being able to do what they were supposed to do. And in response, to that helplessness, there's a variety of feelings. So they suppress or numb their emotions to the point of anhedonia, which means an absence of feeling. The helplessness is often unconsciously exchanged for anger. People who are very stressed also tend to come across as very angry people. If you know uh, a burnt out response worker, their, their initial impression is often that somebody is very angry and very bitter. Another thing that we discovered, which we weren't quite expecting, is that we were really strongly affected by uh, pathos and poignancy, which are basically fancier words for saying, you know, uh, this intense feeling of sympathy and pity and, and of wanting to help. And the helplessness is often, you know, wrapped up in poignancy. Sorrow, regret, all these words. Sometimes I see, as you all have, you know, pictures of starving kids in Africa, and they're just really literally walking skeletons. And that is the picture you could put in the dictionary beside poignancy. It is a poignant sight to see a child starving to death helplessly, you know. So that pathos and poignancy, that's really difficult for us. One of the calls that I used to find really difficult was going into a nursing home and seeing little old ladies and little old men who are perfectly aware, perfectly lucid and clear, but their families had died, everybody that they known had died, and they were spending their life in this, you know, pretty cinder block prison, just waiting to die, because there was nobody left in the world that they knew. And I used to go home and think about those people, and think, maybe I should visit them. You know, it just, it would tug at me that these people were all alone. Incredibly sad. Another thing that uh, you won't be experiencing yet as students, well, maybe you are a little bit as students in a university, but that you're really going to experience when you get out in your uh, professional is this organizational incompetence, the lack of recognition. Uh, it gives rise to something called moral distress. And moral distress is a sense of not being able to do the thing that you wanted to do when you got into the job. Old burnout you know, police officers or paramedics or emergency nurses who say, I don't, just give, I don't give a shit anymore. They are experiencing the effects of real moral distress. So uh, you become a paramedic because you want to help people, but you find that most of the time uh, you're spending your Fridays and Saturday nights picking up drunks and you're picking up people with mental health issues who are abusive to you and very difficult to establish rapport with. And you just keep picking them up and you keep bringing them back to the hospital or wherever it is. And then next week you're just picking them up again. And after years of this, you realize this is futile. This is stupid. You know, I came here to try and help people and I can't. And that helplessness leads into anger. And that's where you see paramedics using derogatory terms for people with mental illness or using derogatory terms for people who are under the influence of alcohol, like I just did, calling them drunks. You know, drunks and crazies. Paramedics get really frustrated with these people because they got into the profession to help them out. Nobody gets into paramedicine because they hate people. But you find a lot of paramedics who've been in the job for a while who kind of hate people. And the reason they do is because they feel so helpless and they have this sense of moral distress, the conflict between what we want to do and the workplace values that say, look, it's not up to you to heal or help. You just get in the hospital, drop them off, get back out on the road, pick up the next body and dump it at the hospital and just keep going until your shift is over.
So those things are actually very difficult for paramedics to work with, very difficult to deal with us, very difficult for us to deal with. So how do we process these things? What do we do when we've had these really strong experiences that affect us powerfully and you know, cause reverberations in our emotions and in our thoughts and in our, the somatic sensations in our body, the tight stomach, the tight shoulders, the nausea, the, the dry mouth, the sleeplessness? What do we do with that stuff? Well, there's a few ways that we deal with it that we're pretty used to uh, that anybody who's worked as a paramedic will be familiar with. First of all, we take a break. We get away from it. If it's too much, we just call in sick. Sorry, can't come in today. I don't want to play. And uh, we found that this is actually a really useful thing, that having downtime is important for people who are working in high-stress situations. Also talking it out. We sit down and we talk with our friends and we talk about what happened and we talk in an interesting way and it's important to understand the dynamic of how we speak because usually you don't get paramedics saying how you doing? I'm okay. How are you? I just had a really bad call. I want to talk about it and then all you do is talk about it like in a counseling session for the next two hours. That's very rare. It does sometimes happen but what generally happens is people say how you doing? Hey not bad. How are you? Not bad. Yeah. Uh, how's the wife? Kids? Good. How's the husband? Kids? Fine. Any good calls lately? Yeah, I did kind of a nasty one the other day. Oh yeah, what happened? And then you talk a little bit about it and there's a little bit of upswelling of emotion. And then, you know, as Canadians, hey, but how about that hockey game? And then we go off and we talk about that. And then we say, you know, that call, it kind of, and it comes back up a little bit, or maybe it comes up in another conversation. But we don't just sit down and go <clears throat> and process these calls. We kind of titrated a little bit. You know, it's like there's this off-gassing process of stuff that we're working with and assimilating. And understanding that dynamic is important for you when you're feeling this kind of an off-gassing process. And it's important when you're listening to somebody who's going through that, that you don't try and, you know, pull all the gas out, tell me more, tell me more, and, you know, make them uncomfortable with the fact that they have to perform for you. Uh, and that you're not feeling like, hey, you're avoiding it. You're not challenging them and saying, come on, let's talk about this. Obviously, this is bothering you. Let people talk about it to the extent that they want to talk about it, but not more. Don't force people to talk about stuff because we actually have pretty good research now that shows that that's not really a healthy thing to do. So talk it out, but talk it out at a nice, comfortable pace for the person who's feeling the emotions. And then we laugh it off. It's also really important to understand this. If you're coming into our culture, if you're in our culture, we are really, really, really sick. We have a bizarre sense of humor. And that's known, and it's understood, and it's adaptive. It's a good thing. We do that within our own culture. We make jokes about dead babies. We make jokes about gross, morbid, disgusting black things that... Most people who are not in professions like us go, I think there's something wrong with you if you think that's funny. Well, yeah, there kind of is something wrong with us. We see people die, and this is how we cope with it. And it's a healthy way to cope with it. So if you ever find yourself laughing at, you know, horrifically dark jokes and think, what have I become? Just realize that this is normal. This is adaptive. This is actually a good thing to do because by taking something that's frightening and overwhelming and laughing about it, we take its power away. If you can laugh at a bully, the bully's not as powerful anymore. If you can laugh at a monster, the monster isn't as scary anymore. It doesn't have as much power over you. So being able to say, I can talk about this stuff. I can talk about that burnt baby that was abused and killed, which we see. If we can joke about that, then it helps us distance ourselves from it. It helps us to cope with that. And it makes the bully or the monster less frightening, less scary, less intimidating, and it gives us less power over us. So don't be ashamed of your gallows humor. It's, a, it's part of our culture. And also working it off. Doing a lot of uh, exercise to burn off the cortisol, to burn off the adrenaline is really good. Generally, the hard, you know, go banging out some weights is not so helpful. The best thing probably to do is like nice long walks, preferably in nature, a nice natural surrounding environment, something that's calming for you. So externally, how can we adjust our environment so that we manage? We can do these things. Take a break, talk it out, laugh it off, work it off. All really healthy, really good stuff. There's also some internal factors that we can do to help us cope with these very powerful emotions and thoughts and somatic sensations that arise because of all of the horrible things that we've seen. And they could be termed, you know, loosely distancing ourselves. We distance ourselves 
from the things that we saw. And there's three basic ways that we do that, three sort of interconnecting ways. Uh, and the first is to suppress what's going on. So we just think, I'm not going to think about it. And that's suppression. And we just go about our normal daily routine. And when the thought comes up, I'm not thinking about it. I'm not thinking about that. Just go back to what we're doing. Or a little bit more uh, energetic, we can consciously avoid those thoughts. So we can immerse ourselves in hobbies or activities or anything that just makes it very difficult for those things to arise within us spontaneously. So we're specifically directing ourselves intentionally towards activity that's going to make it difficult for those things to arise. And the third one, the most maybe powerful and the most unconscious one, is dissociation. And dissociation is when we zone out. So, for example, uh, we can make ourselves zone out by getting drunk. That's a classic dissociation. Or getting stoned or taking drugs that dissociate us from our emotions so that they're not there. Or we can fall into any sort of addictive behavior. The person who finds himself, you know, into the 10th hour of watching pornography on the Internet and thinks, what am I doing? But this isn't me. What you're doing is you're dissociating. You're so overwhelming yourself with stimulus from something else that you're no longer aware of that internal sensation. So there's lots of ways that we can do this. But suppression, avoidance, and dissociation, which conveniently make up the acronym SAD, S-A-D, are how we can distance ourselves. At this point, you're probably expecting me to tell you that this is really unhealthy, that this is not a good thing for us to do. But in fact, it's actually very adaptive in the short term. Being able to suppress or avoid our emotions or even temporarily dissociate are useful things to do while we're at work. When you walk in and the horrific thing is there and those people need our help, you suppress your emotions. You avoid thinking about those feelings. And after the call, when you know that you could get another request for help immediately, you dissociate from what just happened. You don't let yourself get into it. And that is a really healthy thing to do in the short term. And you may not believe that that's actually such a good idea, so I'm going to leave it to an expert to briefly explain to you why uh, the suppression association and dis disassociation, the distancing ourselves, is such a good idea to do. And that expert is Dr. Perry Cox, from the very popular TV show, Scrubs. And this is what he has to say. You see Dr. Wen in there? He's explaining to that family that something went wrong and that the patient died. He's gonna tell them what happened, he's gonna say he's sorry, and then he's going back to work. You think anybody else in that room's going back to work today? And that is why we distance ourselves. That's why we make jokes. We don't do it because it's fun. We do it so we can get by. And sometimes because it's fun. But mostly it's the getting by thing. So it's a good thing to distance, as we just saw. But there are some limits to distancing, as I suggested when I first told you that distancing is a good idea. So we're going to do this suppression, avoidance, dissociation. Uh, and that's a good thing while you're at work. We are quite rightly proud of our ability to suppress powerful emotions so that we can get on and do the job. We can accomplish the mission that we need to do. That's a really useful skill, and society absolutely needs people who can handle emergencies like that. But there are some limits, and to discover the limits, let's try an experiment. I would like you to not think about white bears. Canada, we call white bears like this polar bears because they're found around the North Pole. But don't think about them. So polar bears, interestingly, have so much vitamin A in their livers that it becomes toxic for people to actually eat. So the Inuit who live up north or people who hunt polar bears know that you can eat the polar bear, but don't eat the liver because that'll kill you. But don't think about white bears. They look awfully cute, I know, but in 
many parts of Canada where there are polar bears, people never lock their cars because if you're walking down the street and there's some parked cars around and suddenly a polar bear comes out and they're coming after you and they can smell you from like three kilometers away, then you can jump into somebody's car and close the door and the polar bear can't get you. How'd you do? Were you able to not think about white bears? Don't think about them now. My guess is that probably you weren't able to very well. And you might say, well, that's not fair. I mean, you were just, you know, talking about polar bears and you're putting up white images of cute little bears and all the pictures and sort of stuff. You're bombarding me with imagery of a white bear. How could I not think about it? Do you think that if you've been exposed to a terrible situation and you're getting these flashbacks in your mind, that that is at all similar to what I've been doing to you now? It actually is. And what we find is that when people tell themselves, don't think about this, fill in the blank, uh, it doesn't work. And in fact, the classic example that we use when we say don't think about this is white bears. And there have been books published about this, about our adaptive processes for are we able to stop ourselves from thinking about something. And there have been tons of studies that follow it up. There's something called the white bear suppression inventory, which takes a look at how we suppress our thoughts, whether it's suppression avoidance or dissociation, and different strategies for counselors who find that their client is particularly stuck in uh, you know, dissociation as opposed to suppression or avoidance. There's a, there's a whole science behind this. But what we do know is that in the long term, telling yourself, just don't think about it, does not work. You will not be able to sustain that. Why? Why doesn't that work over the long term? Well, there's a few reasons. And if you think about suppression, for example, suppression is an awful lot like trying to hold a ball underneath the water. It takes an awful lot of effort. You're constantly working at this, and that's exhausting. The other thing that's very interesting about this is something called paradoxical attention. When you tell yourself, don't think about that, then you have to set up a part of your mind that is constantly checking if you're actually thinking about it or not, so that if you do start thinking about it, you stop it. And that keeps reminding you about the thing. So the example I use is imagine that you're going to throw a party and uh, the, your crazy ex tells you that they're coming to the party. And you think, as soon as the crazy ex comes, I'm not going to let them into the party. So instead of enjoying the party, what do you do? You spend the whole party looking around to see if your crazy ex has shown up. And that wrecks your party because you're constantly thinking about the crazy ex or about whatever it is that you don't want coming into your space. And what we say about that is that suppression creates obsession. Trying not to think about it makes you obsess about it, and that's paradoxical attention. Avoidance is the same sort of thing. There's uh, a lot of effort required in avoidance, and when you are busy doing something that helps you to avoid the situation, you often find yourself thinking, why am I doing this? Why, am I, why don't I do my... Oh, I don't want to think about that stuff. Right, okay. Keep on you know, watching TV or whatever you're doing, or riding your motorcycle or eating and eating and eating. All that sort of stuff that helps you to stay focused away from it. And of course, dissociation is a little bit more difficult because with dissociation, it's often an involuntary process. And it's difficult for us to consciously dissociate unless we do it pharmacologically. So we get drunk or stoned or high or whatever we do. And that helps us dissociate so that we're numb and we're distracted. You might think again that I'm going to say there's never a role for dissociation. But in one of my favorite little quirks of science, we actually did a study um, and that's the problem with dissociation is that you're, you're not functional when you're drunk, right? You're not functional when you're completely dissociated. But we did find that if we take people who've been exposed to traumatic things and have them dissociate a little bit by playing Tetris, it actually, that dissociation is adaptive because it helps us uh, decrease the amount of flashbacks that we get. How cool is that? So... These short-term strategies, the distancing strategies, are actually quite good. They're useful strategies, but in the long term, because of loss of functionality, because of the effort that's required, and because of the paradoxical attention that we pay to this, um, they end up not working over the long term. So what can we do over the long term? If at work, using our SAD strategy, suppression, avoidance, and dissociation, if that works at work, then what do we do when we're not at work? What's the balance? If that's the short term, what's the long term answer? And the long term answer we're realizing now through a lot of really good research is a process called mindfulness. Mindfulness and acceptance. So if suppression is shutting it out, mindfulness 
is letting stuff in. And as you can imagine, we have to be careful about that. We have to titrate that. We have to be judicious in how much we allow things to get in. You can't just completely open the doors or else you can get blown away. But a little bit of mindfulness, a little bit of acceptance and getting better and better at it makes us stronger. What do we mean by mindfulness? Well, there's a whole bunch of definitions, a whole bunch of different thoughts that come up when we start thinking about mindfulness. Here's a nice word cloud that you can pause if you want. Take a look at those different words and think a little bit about what do you think of when you think of mindfulness. Here's a great uh, definition from John Kabat-Zinn, who is uh, the founder of mindfulness-based mindfulness -based stress reduction, which kind of started up in the 80s. He's kind of the granddaddy of the whole thing. And he says it's the gentle effort to consistently pay attention to the present moment with acceptance. So there's a few important terms there. First of all, it's a gentle effort. You're not a drill sergeant forcing yourself to do something. It's gentle. It's also consistent, which means over the long term. If I say, hey, take a quick look at this, we can go, huh? And I'll get your attention. But holding your attention is a whole different thing, as any entertainer or lecturer will tell you. Holding somebody's attention is much more difficult than catching it in the first place. <clears throat> so keeping that consistency of their attention. And the attention is focused on here and now, in the present moment, what's going on around you, whether you like it or not. What is actually around you is what you focus on. And there's a sense of acceptance, not how do I get out of here, but this is okay. This is all right. I can be here. I can be comfortable here. So let's try it. And what I'd like you to do, wherever you are right now, is to close your eyes and just listen. Listen to the sounds that are around you. Listen to maybe the, the whir of your computer's fan. I can hear traffic in the distance. What can you hear? Now, Maintaining this awareness of sound around you, I'd like to open, have you open your eyes and take a look. Look at the screen. Look at your computer, that your TV or whatever you're using. Look beyond it. Look around you. Look at the room you're in. Keep on listening. Keep on looking. Look at the different colors you can see. Look at where there are shadows. Just look and listen. Now, maintaining that looking, that open eyes, open ears, I'd like you to open up your senses and become aware of what's going on in your body. Feel yourself sitting in the chair. Feel your feet, if they're in shoes or, or bare feet. Feel your back. Feel your chest move as you breathe. Feel the wind moving through your mouth or your nose as you're breathing. Just look, listen, and feel. An interesting thing for you to try is to set your timer for about five minutes or ten minutes and just say, I'm going to continue to be aware of going on around me. When I give this as a talk, I usually you know, have a few minutes of trying to maintain people's awareness in the present moment. And then when we're done, the timer goes off, I say, how did you do? And usually what we find is that people have wandered away. They start thinking about other things. They start thinking about the next talk that comes up. Should I go to the washroom now because this guy's kind of boring and I want to hear the next one? How long are we going to continue to do this mindfulness exercise? I'm really uncomfortable. All these thoughts come up and then we think, no, no, just come back, come back. So we wander and we return. And the awareness of that process is also a part of mindfulness. And how do you treat yourself when you return? Because most people, when they realize that their mind has wandered off and they say, ah, come back, come back, it's with a sense of, ah, man, how could I wander away so much? And they get frustrated. And that's where the acceptance comes in. Acceptance not only of this moment, but acceptance of the fact that your mind is going to wander away and you're going to pull it back. And it's going to wander away and you're going to pull it back. And this just goes on and on and on. And that's just part of how our minds work. So sitting and being aware and being mindful is actually something that's really useful. Does it work? 
I'm sort of advocating that, you know, we get paramedics or police officers or, you know, soldiers or something. And can you imagine a bunch of police officers sitting on cushions with their legs folded up with, the, you know, the bulletproof vests and the guns and everything doing their meditation? Like, how ludicrous is that? Actually, the reason that we find people doing things like this is because there's a lot of really good research that shows that this works. And you can pause the video here and take a look at these. I've given the DOI number for most of them, so you can look them up on uh, the internet and start reading some of these studies. But I'll point out three specifically. And the three I want to point out are systematic reviews. So a systematic review means that it's a study of studies that have been done. It's a culmination of a whole bunch of primary studies. The first one I'll point out is from 2004, where they say mindfulness-based stress reduction can actually maybe help with a whole range of individual things, of clinical and non-clinical problems, just general life stuff. And usually when people hear about mindfulness and the benefits of it, they say, you know, there's nothing that really actually helps improve everything like that. You're talking about panacea. But in fact, if you think about exercise, exercise helps us sleep. It helps us lose weight. It helps balance our endocrine system, balance our um, you know, glucagon and insulin. And it uh, increases our cardiovascular health. It's got these really wide range of physical, mental, emotional effects from one activity, exercising. And mindfulness, in a way, is kind of the equivalent of physical exercise for our body, only for our mind. The next uh, systematic review that I want to talk about comes out of 2012, and their finding was mindfulness and acceptance-based interventions are associated with robust and substantial reductions in anxiety and comorbid depressive systems. So if you came up with a drug that helped relieve anxiety and depression, the two big sort of uh, mainstays of why people present to counseling, you would make millions off of that drug if it really worked. And this is an activity that really works. And coming a little bit further into the future, 2013, mindfulness-based therapy is an effective treatment for a variety of psychological problems especially effective for anxiety, depression, and stress. So this whole crazy idea of just simply being aware in the moment, mindfulness with acceptance, actually is quite healthy for us and helps decrease the stress. And if you think back to the car, being mindful and simply being aware of what's going on is kind of like telling Amy and the hippo and the scientist that you just be quiet for a minute. Relax. Everything's okay. Just breathe. There's a reason we call it coming back to our senses. So, like any intervention, there are particular cautions. And a lot like physical exercise, it's important to be careful when you're hurt. If you are really stressed and really overwhelmed and you're having lots of flashbacks, if you're really adrenalinized, then don't go sitting down, opening up your mind and letting the emotions rise up because you'll be overwhelmed. So often this is a good time, if you're that overwhelmed, to get some help. Uh, or to do just a little bit of mindfulness, a little bit of activity. So try to be mindful and present when you're doing the dishes. Try to be mindful and present while you're cleaning something or going for a walk. It's hard to be mindful when you're watching TV because we get sucked into it or, you know, playing on the internet or something. But try to be, try to do something that doesn't draw your attention like a television show and be mindful of yourself doing it, of driving, walking, whatever. Start low, work up to more. Don't sit down and say, I'm going to be mindful for 10 hours in a row. You're not going to do it. Try being mindful when you're first starting for a minute. Then build up to about 10 minutes. You, didn't, you wouldn't think it would be that hard to do 10 minutes, but it's actually pretty challenging. It is possible to overtrain in this. If you are too sensitive and you can open up yourself too much, there's a balance. There's a balance between shutting down and opening up. It's kind of like getting into a really hot bath. You kind of go down ooh, 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 a little bit, a little bit more, ooh, ooh, and you just kind of slowly sink into it. You don't just force yourself into a hot bath. But we also need to bathe, so there's a good reason to get into the bath. And that's the type of balance you're trying to find. So if you think about it, here's how we can actually do the process. We make some time for this, whether it's a minute or 10 minutes. Don't do much more than 10 minutes when you're first starting. We say to ourselves, this is my time to do this, so I'm going to stop thinking about all the other stuff. And when I sit down and be mindful, there's nothing that I'm trying to do other than being mindful. So we're not controlling, we're not suppressing, we're avoiding. We sit and we are aware of our surroundings, the sights, the sounds, the somatic sensations. Sound tends to be the one that is most uh, powerful for bringing us into the moment. 
whatever comes up as you're doing this, that's okay. If you find yourself wandering as you return, don't get mad at yourself. Just note, oh, I wandered and I returned. That's interesting. If thoughts keep arising, say, that's interesting. Those thoughts keep arising. Let these things run their course. Don't try to um, force yourself into any one state other than just being aware. Remember, this is meant to be gentle. So be kind. Don't be hard on yourself. Don't be so critical of yourself, as people often we are, often are. And once the timer goes off and it's done, you might want to take a few minutes and kind of think about it a little bit and go. So what happened during that ten minutes? What was that? I keep. I seem to keep thinking about this. I seem to keep thinking about that. I wonder why that is. It's fine to sort of analyze a little bit gently when the session is done. And if you think about it, really, what we're talking about here is just being a friend to yourself. If you're going to be my friend, or if you want to have a friend, wouldn't you want a friend who makes time for you, who lets their stuff go, who doesn't try always to tell you what we're going to be talking about in the friendship, who is aware of what's going on in the conversation, who's accepting of your thoughts, who's patient, who's kind to you, and then goes and thinks about the conversation that you have and comes back and says, you know, last time we were talking, I kind of noticed this. You, you talk about this a lot. Is that something that's a big issue for you? You're just being a friend to yourself. That's what really mindfulness and acceptance is all about. So, two questions. What is what about one is what about flashbacks? As you've got this, you know, tough stuff coming up, isn't it healthy to distance ourselves? Yes, it is. If the flashbacks come up, if it's really difficult, if this is stressful and disconcerting for you, then you need to get out of the hot bath a little bit and lighten up so that you're not forcing yourself into these situations that are making you uncomfortable and vulnerable. And also Another thing that people say is, this is kind of goofy, isn't it? I mean, sitting down and you know, being friend to yourself, being mindful and all this weird stuff. I'm old enough to remember the 1970s when all of my you know, previously sane adults in my life and role models uh, went out and put on these really weird new Nike running shoes and polyester clothes and started running when we had perfectly good cars that could take you wherever you wanted to. And they would go and they'd start to run just for health. It was a goofy thing. And then aerobics started and people were dancing on TV and everybody said, you know, this stuff is bizarre. Now, in, you know, the 2000s and teens, uh, someone says, I'm going to the gym. And we say, have a good workout. It's just completely normal. I'm going to go for a run. Oh, cool. I run too. How much do you run? Whereas if you said to somebody, you know, I'm going to go and I'm going to meditate, they'd be like, uh, okay, um, good luck, you know, uh, break a leg. I don't know, what do you say to somebody who meditates? They might say, oh, I do that too, you know, what do you do? But it's still pretty rare. It's, it's kind of a cutting edge thing in our society. So is it kind of goofy? Yeah, it is kind of goofy in our society right now, but that doesn't mean that it's wrong. And probably in another 10, 20 years, this is going to be very mainstream. When I started meditating, it was back in 83 or 84, and it was an absolutely bizarre thing. Now mindfulness is everywhere. Everybody's doing it, and it seems to be much more common. You've probably heard of mindfulness before you started hearing about this lecture. So, Trying to sum up a little bit, if you think about it, there's a range of emotions that we're talking about. And on one end is in vulnerability, where we're a robot. And that's actually quite good when we're at work. And there's another end of the spectrum where we're very vulnerable. And sometimes, you know, the negative uh, view of that is that we're just like little babies crying about everything. But sometimes, if it's safe, we really do need to open up our vulnerability to listen to what's going on inside so that we have a good idea of what's going on. A lot of people say all the time, you know, you need to talk more about what you're feeling. How many of us actually know what we're feeling? How do you find out what you're feeling if you don't take the time to sit down and be vulnerable and actually listen? And then in our daily lives, what we found as professionals is that there's a balance between that invulnerability and vulnerability. We do put our hands on people. We do say, I'm sorry. We, you know, we do sometimes hug patients. That's appropriate. And we need to find that balance inside ourselves, too, so that there are times where we're vulnerable and times where we're more invulnerable. And we balance this out so that we can live our lives in a healthy way. Now, we talk about balance. We talk about, you know, this sense of the, even the picture I'm using, this is this perfect sort of static balance. We just got to get the white, the right uh, weight of the rocks on each side and then just, you know, no strong winds and it just sort of stays permanently static and we've got the right balance. 
but life isn't like that. Life is not about finding one still point and staying in that still point. Life is a dynamic balance. And we have control and avoidance that also leads into and becomes mindfulness and acceptance, which becomes and leads into control and avoidance. You can't practice mindfulness without some sense of control. You stop yourself from thinking other things. And you can't practice control or avoidance without at least the mindfulness and awareness that you need to because your emotions are starting to overrun you. So it's this ongoing dynamic balance and the yin-yang symbol of the dyad from Taoism is a perfect expression of how we balance these things back and forth and they flow into each other. In um, couples therapy and in dealing with intimacy between people. We talk about a process of rupture and repair. Something happens and then it's fixed and then something happens and then it's fixed. And that rupture and repair, which you could go by a, you know, a bunch of different names, the yin and the yang, whatever you want to call it. But this process of advance and retreat or rupture and repair is one that happens all throughout life. So it's a really important dynamic. We see it in waking and sleeping and exercise and recovery hurting ourselves and healing, studying and relaxing, working in holidays, intimacy, isolation, all that sort of stuff. And as we go through this process of rupture and repair over time, what we begin to develop is a sense of resiliency. We've been here before. You know, when I first started doing martial arts and someone would punch my arm and my arm would hurt, it would hurt for days and I think, oh my God, why am I doing this? And then later, you know, someone punches in your arm, you think, ah, oh, it's going to hurt for a few days. I'm much more resilient about getting punched now that I've been doing martial arts for a few decades. And I'm much more resilient in my emotions because of the fact that I've had this rupture and repair cycle as a paramedic, rupture to the point of post-traumatic stress. There's a really great expression of this in the Japanese art called kintsukuri. And in kintsukuri, they make really beautiful bowls. So the artisans come together and they, they spend their time to make a really beautiful bowl and then they intentionally smash it. And once it's broken, they put it back together using gold in the seams. To me, that's such a beautiful image. That's such a beautiful, succinct expression of how we live. It's almost a haiku in itself. We work, we get broken, and then with effort, with mindfulness, with acceptance, yes, it's broken, I'll put it back together, and in the seams, we have gold. And when you see someone who has really lived an authentic life, someone who's gone through the extremes of this rupture and repair, you can see the gold in their seams. You can see a glowing of wisdom and maturity that comes from people who have allowed themselves to go through this process. We've got a tremendous opportunity as paramedics to go through a very powerful dynamic of human growth, but we have to be ready for it. We have to be prepared for it. We have to know how to put ourselves back together and put gold into those seams. So in summary, we have the idea of mindfulness and acceptance and control and avoidance. We have to learn to be in control. For most people who are paramedics or want to be paramedics, we're usually pretty good at this. In fact, we're kind of control freaks. So we don't have a lot of problem with being in control. What we do have to learn is how to let go and accept and let things be. And we have to understand that we might not be very good at that yet. But again, be kind and gentle and accepting and be patient about the fact that this is going to take some time to learn. Once you've learned the mindfulness and acceptance, and once you've learn the control and avoidance, then you need to learn that dynamic flow, how to move between them comfortably so that as the situation demands, we can create the appropriate response so that when we're at work and there's something terrible and we need to just do it, we just do it. But when we're off work and we can relax and these things come up, we can just allow them to come up. It's okay. I can be present with the discomfort of this recollection. And then understand that this is a really healthy thing to do. This is a balanced way for us to live. And this leads to resiliency and depth and maturity. What happens when we break? That's what we'll talk about next.